You have to look at the whole Quran and the Sunnah to understand it. You cannot come to one single line and say this is what Islam is based on. So what is Islam based on? First of all, marriage is important in Islam. You have to take care of this, this institution because you have children coming out of it. It's a life. A woman who is divorced has difficulty getting married again. Maybe a man can marry easily, but it's difficult. The supply is far greater than the demand. And this is noticeable and common sense. Now, I have a problem with my wife. And I am assuming she's the aggressor. Because if I'm the aggressor, I have no right even to advise her. I'm the aggressor. I have no right to abandon her. I'm the aggressor. So the, the ayah, the verse, is referring to a situation where the woman is the aggressor. And she is not complying. She is not obedient. She's, she's, she doesn't want life to go on. Islam tells you, advise her. And then abandon her in bed. Do not have any intimacy. And if she does not comply, and you think that by spanking her, she will go back to the track and she will listen, then do so. One says, Sheikh, I, yesterday I beat my wife. Why? He said, I gave her advice for a couple of minutes and I abandoned her in bed for 10 minutes and then I, I beat the hell out of her. I said, you're not a Muslim? A proper Muslim? No. You should advise her for a week, for two weeks, for three weeks, keep on preaching her. This is haram. What you're doing is haram. Allah is not happy with you. you. This doesn't work. Abandon her in bed. Don't leave the house. Don't kick her out. Don't send her to her family. You're both in the same house. You're both in the same bedroom. But give her, give her your back. Don't look at her or give her any kind of, of uh, feeling that you're attracted to her. The wife will say, Alhamdulillah, I hope he stays like this for a whole year. One, one month, it, would, it may affect her. If this does not help, I did all what I can do, then Islam tells you it's permissible to spank her. Okay, put on your uh, boxing gloves. And let's start training. No. How, how do I beat her? The Prophet said, do not leave a mark. Do not break a bone. Do not shed blood. Do not leave a, mar leave a mark. If I do this, it's going to be red. I can't do this? Yes, you can't. It will leave a mark. <laughs> How would you want me to beat her then? Ibn Abbas says, use the miswak. What kind of, it, does it inflict pain? Does it? Well, if I do like this, to, it, it's not painful, so, but it is not meant to be painful. It is m meant to be mental. Into, Ya Allah, all this love that we had, all these beautiful days that we've shared, and now it comes to you hitting me with a toothbrush, with a miswak? Yes, because you've done something and you have been the aggressor. This, if it doesn't help, then you have to bring someone to counsel between you and her from your family and from her family. And if this does not work, then it's divorce. And hundreds and hundreds of women, when they know about the miswak, who were divorced, they would say, Wallahi, I'd rather my husband beats me with a miswak rather than being divorced as I am for three or four years with the kids. So, does Islam promote beating of women? Yes or no? Did the Prophet ﷺ beat one single woman in his life? Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, said, by Allah, the Prophet had never... This is hadith. So you don't understand the Quran without the hadith. She says, by Allah, the Prophet had never beaten a woman, nor a child, unless it was for the cause of Allah in jihad, in fighting. And of course, n neither the women nor the children would hold uh, or raise a, a, a sword in the face of anyone. So the Prophet had never done this. So if you understand this, you know the role of that in marriage. Now, does, if we know that a brother dom domestically abuses his wife and his family, her family are not defending her, it's not your responsibility to go and intervene. It, it, you and a bunch of strong guys, you know, guys from the gym, let's go and give him a, a, a battery. Let's go and 
you know, break a tooth or two. It's not your job. It's the job of the family of the girl. And if they don't want to, it's her job to call the police and get help. But you coming out from outside and you're not related neither to the man and to the girl and you want to become yani, a, a, a law enforcer, this is not permissible in Islam and it's not even logical. No one would accept this in Allah knows I say in my uh, prayer and in my daily life, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So I follow what the Prophet tells me. So she says, but we would like to go with my girls at, at college or at uni to uh, uh, Switzerland for skiing. How can how can they go and I'm, I don't go with them? It's haram. Yes, but I want to. Ya akhi or ya ukhi. Does everything we wish and hope for or want in this life materializes? Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah abuse with him, so one of his uh, 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 sons wanting to buy something. And he said, my son, whenever you desire something, you buy it. This is not life, even if you can afford it. So as a Muslim, I have to comply with, with my Islam. And I always give this example. My life is a picture. Islam is the frame. So a proper Muslim brings the frame, puts it on his picture, and cuts whatever is out of the frame. So Islam fits like a glove to my life. People nowadays are not happy with this. So they put the frame on the picture, but they find that their picture is far bigger than what Islam really is. So they crack this side, and they put, you know, uh, 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 plasters here and try to put glue here. And at the end of the day, you have a distorted frame that does not fit what Allah Azza wa Jal has revealed to the Prophet Ali Sussam and Allah Muhammad Sussam. Does women have to wear abaya? What is abaya? It is the jilbab that a, a sister wears and covers her, it's loose and it's uh, uh, not transparent and it covers her body. So is, is she obliged to wear a abaya? No. She's obliged to wear what covers her body. But if she wears a, a, a tight shirt, as I've seen some of the sisters, wearing really tight, real, real tight, no abaya, nothing, just a shirt and a skirt, and sometimes not a skirt, a trouser. But she covers her head, alhamdulillah. Come on, what is this? This is not what Islam uh, uh, promotes. Islam promotes that you cover your whole body so that to protect you. Yani, this is not because Islam hates beauty. Islam adores beauty. A Prophet said, Allahu jamilun yuhibbul jamal. Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. But what kind of beauty does Allah love? Does Allah love a beauty of a woman in a bikini? Definitely not. This is something too revealing and un-Islamic, and Allah Azza wa Jalla abhors this. But Allah Azza wa Jalla loves the beauty of Iman, and He loves a woman to be beautiful to her mahrams. There's no problem in that, but exposing herself <coughs> in such a fashion to those who are not lawful for her is not permissible in Islam. So she's allowed to wear whatever covers her body properly. And this can be a jilbab, this can be a abaya, this can be a trench coat that is uh, uh, quite loose and is not uh, uh, showing her figure, etc. Can she show her feet outside of salah? Definitely not. And the consensus of scholars is that she has to cover her feet when she is traveling, when she is in the presence of non-mahram men. Because Yani, it reveals a lot. In Salah, it's an issue of dispute among scholars. Whether it's permissible or not, some scholars say that it is permissible providing that it does not yani, put a limit to it. Is it to the ankle or half of the leg? Or can she wear a channel and pray in that? Or is it okay up to the knee? Where is the limit? No scholars give us the limit, but Sheikh Al-Sam in may Allah have mercy on his soul, said that it is permissible for her when she's in her, in, at her house and no nan mahram are present, it is permissible for her to pray uh, uh, with her feet exposed. 
Some scholars say, no, this is not permissible. She has to cover her feet, but the sole of her foot is permissible when she, when she uh, uh, prostrates. This is permissible because this is something that is negligible. But the, 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 the what do you call this? The face of her foot? I don't know. I, yeah. Speak to me in Arabic, I can no, I relate. But the top, the, the, top, the top of the foot, while she's standing, no, this has to be covered by either wearing socks or by her long um, dress. Wearing the niqab depends on your conviction. It is a must to some scholars, and it is not a must, but recommended to others. So depending on what a sister believes, if she believes that, no, I don't have to cover my face, it's okay for her to go out, but she must not wear makeup. <coughs> she must not put, uh, uh, what do you call it, base makeup and covering her uh, uh, scars and, you know, knife uh, wounds and pimples <laughs> and whatever. And then she goes out to the street and everybody looks at her, oh, mashallah, she's beautiful. Let her make wudu and anyway. <laughs> No, this is, this, is, this is not permissible. She has to be natural. Because by putting these uh, things, she would, she's calling people to herself. If you believe that niqab is must, which I do, in this case you have to uh, put it on whether you are in this society, in Saudi Arabia or wherever, this is a form of protection. And I believe if I wear a woman, I wear the niqab all the time. Because I don't have to care about how my, I'm, the, I'm wearing my hair. I don't have to care about my uh, uh, scar wounds and whatever. Everything is covered. Khalas. I easy go and I, I easy come. But with those sisters who would like to yeah, beautify themselves, they spend like half an hour or an hour. Well, uh, this facial expression stuff is, well, I hate too much. Sisters call me on the phone, please go video. I have to see your facial expressions. What is this? It's a question and answer. Why? I have daughters with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. And when I take them to the dentist, I don't speak a word. She herself unveils up to the nose. The doctor says, I'd like to see your face. So that, she, she, you're working on my teeth. You're not working on my eyes. You, so you don't need to do this. Well, I don't have, I don't intervene. It, it's your teeth, it's your face. You do whatever you want to do. Sisters are away. So this is what a lot of those who don't, who, who, who detest, who are agitated by Islam, always come up with, I have to see your face. If, yeah, if I go to a government office and I'd like to speak to a minister, for example, why does he insist on me unveiling? This is my own personal uh, uh, wish to cover my face. Yani, do you have, does this minister, does this Judas, uh, 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 the guy that works in, in a jewelry shop. If a woman comes to him with micro jobs or mini skirts, does he say, listen, I, I can see your facial expressions, but I don't want to see any more expressions. Please cover up. Would, would they accept this? <coughs> they wouldn't. So subhanAllah, it, it has to do with your freedom of speech, your, what, what you believe in, what's your conviction. And is asking, is it permissible to have friends with the opposite sex? And the answer is no. <laughs> the brother is asking about the ruling in Islam of honor killing. There is anything, there is nothing in Islam that uh, uh, is related to this. This is not even tribal. Yeah, in Saudi Arabia, where I come from, we don't have this. Of course, no one yeah, he congratulates his daughter, MashaAllah, you had a, a relationship, MashaAllah. <laughs> this is not something accepted, but there is nothing as such as honor killing. It is found in few countries only, and whoever does this, I give him the tiding of hell. If you kill your daughter because she went out with her boyfriend, this is disgraceful, this is un-Islamic, this is sinful. By killing her, mashallah, you go to hell from the widest gates. So think twice. 
Who cares what the people say? As long as I'm going to hell. Yeah, the hell with the people with all due respect. I don't care about them talking about my honor. I, I care about whether I'm going to end up in paradise or in hell. So there is nothing related in Islam as honor killing. If someone kills your father, if someone kills your brother, if someone kills your loved one in front of you, Islam does not give you the permission to react and take or make justice with your own hand. If you do, you're in hell. If you do, I'm avenging my brother. He killed my father in front of me. I'm going to kill him. If you do, you go to hell. You have to report this and law has to, be, uh, has to prevail. So, there is, I, 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 I read this sometimes, and I am saddened by those who do it. They're not related to Islam. And if you look into their families, you'll find that they are far, far away from practicing. So, why attach it to Islam? This is unfair and unjust in Allah. It's not permissible for women to travel. And the distance is not specified, meaning that it is not 70 kilometers and below this is okay, uh, more than that is not okay. It is what's considered to be traveling. So we are in Sheffield. If a sister wants to meet her husband in London, the people of Sheffield, when they go to London, do they shorten prayer? This is traveling. But if a sister in East London wants to go to West London, it might take an hour and a half, probably with a traffic jam or something more or less. Is this traveling? No. So if she's taking the tube, the coach, if she is with another sister in a cab, this is halal. What is not halal is to travel and whatever is considered in a city to be a traveling to another city, this is haram for her to travel without a mahram. What if she's going to study abroad like Al? Wallahi, studying abroad for Al, yani, obey Allah. Now, if a sister says, listen, I got a scholarship in Jami'at Al-Imam in Riyadh, or in so-and-so Jami'at in Al-Azhar, or in, in this country, I'll be accompanied by my mahram. And I will, he will take me to that campus. The campus is all females. I'm being taken care of. I cannot travel or leave or, you know, uh, uh, do this or that. I'm at always attended with food, with all my necessities. This case is halal. But for her to go to a university and somewhere else in Saudi or whatever, and then travel from one place to the other and she goes and gets her own groceries and she has no mahram in that country. No, this is not a, a problem. No. As for the uh, question of the foundation on, on the face, if this is among mahrams and other females, yes, it's completely permissible. You can wear full makeup in front of other women uh, or in front of your mahram brothers, uh, Father, uh, um, not cousins, huh? not brothers-in-law. Your brother-in-law is not your mahal. He's a complete stranger to you. Can she refuse her husband to marry another woman? If before the contract, yes, this is her right. So if someone proposes to you and you say, okay, I'm, I'm willing, but I put it as a condition that you may not marry a second wife. And if you do, then I have the right to call it off. This is your right. But if you're already married and he wants to get married to another woman, you have no say in it. You can't yeah, influence it. He's, he's, no man would go and ask the permission for his first wife and accept her to agree. It is painful. Us men think it's, eh, what is it, eh? what? another wife. But I usually talk to my wife like this and I say, if I get married again, you'll have 24 hours for yourself. You don't have to wear makeup. You don't have to take care of the house. You don't have to cook three meals. And th I think that this is the most important thing in my life. I don't work. To them, it's a different story altogether. It is not part 
of the marriage constitution that you seek the permission of your first wife or second wife or third wife you want to get married to another one. However, it is highly advisable if you want to do it to inform them, not like lots of the brothers come after 10, 20 years of marriage and say, well, this is my 18 years old boy from my secret marriage. This, this is bad, this is cheating, this is not good. I would not say it's haram, but this is not how a wife and a man should have their communication together. If you want to get married, a man can get married for a number of reasons and I can spill it out يعني, uh, uh, in no time. يعني, uh, but it's his right. Allah gave him this right. Usually, no one does it for the sake of, you know, mashallah, come, how many wives you have? I have two. Mashallah, you're the man. <laughs> it's not like this. It's not, I have two wives, alhamdulillah. My second wife I married 23 years ago. And if I show you my head, you could see the high heel traces on them. <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do. And it's difficult. And not only that, I'm always intimidated that I will go to hell if I'm not fair to them. So yani, every time I think twice before buying something or giving something, you have to care about their feelings. If you start talking on the phone and she's next to you, how is it you balance between answering her and taking care of her feelings? It is a headache, but it is something you have to do. When you have to do it, you have to do it. So uh, I would uh, say yani, clearly Islamically, it is not part of the responsibility of a man to seek the permission of his first wife before getting married in Allah. This is, I believe, I believe personally that men should be segregated from you and they should have their own quarters. If you were to work with uh, men, you could do this by either uh, uh, Skype or telephone or emails, try to avoid contact because contact is not permissible at all. I am not uh, against uh, uh, females. Uh, uh, what you call it, male, male chauvinism? Yeah, I, I'm, I don't have this. Yeah, with the grace of Allah, I have two wives. So I'm completely with the, the sisters. I have 13 girls. No boys. So I don't know how to treat boys. Huh? All around me I see is girls. I love my daughters. I have four of them married, alhamdulillah, six grandchildren. Four of them are girls also. So I'm swimming in an ocean of ostrich. <laughs> so don't you ever think that I have anything against my yani, daughters or my wives. But by Allah, I care for them more than I care for myself. Because not because they are my honor, because I love them, I cherish them, and I try to apply whatever is in the Quran and Sunnah to them because I know this is the best for them. Allah Azza wa knows best. The brother is asking, is there a difference of opinion among scholars whether you can sign the marriage contract stating that you will not get married? No, this is I mean, a contract, a condition that is part of the man's uh, right to uh, waiver, if this is I mean, the right word to say. If there are conditions that I can say I don't want. Likewise, the sisters have conditions. They may say we don't need a sister that lives with her parents and they're old and in need of care and she tells her husband listen i don't want you to come except on mondays and thursdays i'm living with my parents and she uh, yeah, he wants this because if she moves to another house she won't be able to take care of her parents and the husband is, is is happy and she's happy this is okay once she says that you're not allowed to get married this is up to her but is it advisable no because after five years when he wants to get married and she says, this is the contract. What is the, uh, the other alternative? Divorce. And who wants this? And Allah knows best. <laughs>